Well, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for this day. Each day you give us is precious. We pray that you would help us to live these days as best we can in service to our neighbors and friends, in service and love toward you. We thank you for the mild weather we've had and pray, Lord, that even as winter comes, we look forward to spring and the wonderful new life that reminds us of the life you have ahead for us. We pray for those who aren't with us today and for those who we've mentioned with needs and concerns, for Mary and Emma and Gitta, Lorraine, for Peggy, Lucy and Susie and Glenn, as we not sure, or Gene, we're not sure where he might be today. We ask that you be with them wherever they are, whatever they're doing, that those who are ill might be healed, those who are dealing with emotional or spiritual issues might find strength and those who we could be of help to you show us how we can do that we pray for those people in the ukraine and the middle east where war ruins their lives ravages the world around them we thank you lord on one hand that we are not experienced in that kind of thing and we pray for those who are that you would somehow bring peace to those areas of the world and to the world in general as you have intended as you created the world to be we ask that you be with us today as we study your word open our hearts and minds to receive this word help us especially to see the good news in your word and to share that good news with others wherever we go in jesus name. Amen. But I'm shutting it off. Yeah. Okay, it's done. Again. <laughs> okay, we're good to go. Um, talking about God call is just a little story. My brother in law's father was a very cantankerous old fella, and everybody knew it. And at his funeral, the family's sitting up front, and somebody's cell phone rang in the church. And my brother-in-law's brother leaned over to him, and he said, that's God calling. He wants to send Dad back. <laughs> 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 so um, every time I hear a phone in church, I think about that. So, um, so this Sunday is Reformation Sunday. So you can remember we're red uh, in honor of the Reformation. Um, a special day, of course, in the life of the Lutheran Church. We celebrate the day when Luther uh, nailed the 95 theses onto the uh, castle door in Wittenberg and uh, seen as sort of the, uh, the precipitating event of the uh, Reformation. Um, things went on from there to change not only the church, but change the world. Um, Luther, <laughs> Luther had no interest in eliminating the church, um, or he had no interest in starting a new religion. Um, what Luther wanted to do was make changes in the church. He, he loved the church. He was dedicated to the church. He was dedicated to God, um, but he saw some abuses in the church and some places where he felt the church wasn't proclaiming the proper message. Um, a big part of that movement came when he was actually reading Ephesians, as I understand it, uh, when he first had the revelation of justification by grace through faith. Um, he said when he learned about that, it was as if the weight of the world was lifted off his shoulders. Um, Luther, before that, had struggled and struggled with not being worthy of God's love, uh, not deserving of God's forgiveness. Uh, he even would would punish himself. He would, you know, whip himself, do things like that to try and uh, atone for his sins and for his unworthiness. Um, in one of his prayers, he, he refers to himself as a lowly worm. Oh, lowly, lowly worm that I am, he said. Um, so, you know, we might call that poor self-esteem today. <laughs> Um, 
But, you know, for Luther, it was just that sense of unworthiness and undeserving of God's love. And so when he realized that it is God's grace and not our worthiness that brings us salvation or justification, as he called it, um, he said it was such a relief to him. And that's why when he talks about freedom, we, we, we hear Jesus in our uh, reading this morning talk about freedom. You know, Luther said that was is the freedom of the gospel, that we don't labor under being good enough. We don't struggle with earning or deserving God's love, the freedom to know that we are saved by God's grace just because God loves us so much. Um, you know, of course, there is, uh, you know, again, our response to that, um, the responsibility that comes with having a great gift given to us. Um, but you know, in the end, it's not up to us. It's God's love. It's God's grace. Um, it comes by faith when we truly believe and trust in Jesus. And, you know, a big part of that faith is to understand, yes, it's not me. I can do it myself, but I do believe that Jesus can and has saved me from the power of sin and to put our trust, put our hope in Jesus, and not uh, have, not not try to do it ourselves. You know, again, we respond to it, but our faith, our trust, our security, if you will, comes from knowing that Jesus has already died for our sins. Um, one of Luther's famous sayings is that uh, a Christian is a perfectly free slave of none, and a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all. So it's, you know, we talk a lot about some Lutheran conundrums or Lutheran conundra, uh, you know, like the law and gospel thing. Um, and, and this is it, that we are uh, slaves to none when it comes to the law, when it comes to uh, our salvation. But as followers of Jesus, we are expected to be servants of all, and we love our neighbors as ourselves, and we serve those around us. So we are, uh, you know, it's like being at the same time saint and sinner. You know, we are saints through our faith, but we're sinners through our human nature. Um, so uh, Lutherans have a lot of two-sided coins that we deal with. Um, so, uh, so, uh, we're going to look at the gospel uh, for this week um, rather than, you know, we often go to the Romans lesson, which is uh, a sign for uh, Reformation Sunday, where Luther talks more about, uh, well, where Paul talks about justification by grace apart from works. Um, but we're going to look at the gospel and see how this gospel relates to uh, that idea of justification by faith and, and freedom. Uh, that Jesus talks about. So the gospel reading is from John 8, verses 31 through 36. Uh, Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word. He reveals the truth that sets people free from sin. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And, um, you know, so this, one of the big things here is is truth. We'll talk a little bit about truth, what Jesus was talking about when he um, talks about truth. Um, let me see which of these. Um, okay. So, um First of all, who was Jesus talking to? And that's one of the things we often have to um, address. You know, like whenever uh, Jesus, uh, Matthew relates so many of Jesus' parables that have to do with weeping and gnashing of teeth and that judgment 
we have to remember Jesus was talking to scribes, Pharisees, unbelievers, um, those who had faith in themselves rather than faith in Jesus. And so those those things may be a warning to us, but may not necessarily be directly addressed to us because they were addressed to those unbelievers and those who had faith in themselves. Um, so here, uh, John tells us, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him. Now, most often when John refers to the Jews in his gospel, it is the Jewish authorities, uh, the Jewish leadership, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, all those people we hear about. But in this sense, it seems like it may be a more general um, reference to the Jews. Because uh, he talks about those who had believed in Jesus. And, you know, although there were probably were some scribes, Pharisees, those others who did believe in Jesus. And we know that the first Christians were Jewish converts to, to following Jesus. So um, this is really, these Jews would be considered like the, the believers, those who believed in God as opposed to the pagans or, you know, others who uh, worshiped other gods and believed in other gods. These were Jews, followers of God, who then had begun, become followers of Jesus and believed in Jesus. Now, this is one of those um, interesting little phrases where one of the commentators says, arguments abound as to how John is using the word here. <laughs> Um, and he's talking about the word believe. Uh, what did it mean that they believed in Jesus? And um, he says that most likely John uses this word to believe in the sense of commitment, acceptance, reliance, trust, faith, teachings, word, testimony. So it's all those things that, that I just mentioned before that we have, we put our faith, our trust, our hope in Jesus, not in ourselves. And so these are Jews, um, believers in God, who now have come to, to trust Jesus and to follow Jesus and, um, you know, begin to put some of their hope in Jesus. Now, maybe not to the extent where they believe Jesus is the Messiah just yet. Um, and we'll see, um, you know, as Jesus talks to them further, we kind of get the impression they don't recognize Jesus yet as the Messiah but they are following Jesus. They're believing in him, uh, starting to think that maybe there is some promise in him. Um, the idea that they had believed in him um, kind of tells us that maybe that belief was starting to fade, uh, that they had believed in him in the past, or perhaps that idea that I just referred to, that their belief was as yet incomplete. Um, they had believed in Jesus up to a point, but they didn't yet believe in him as the Messiah. So maybe some, some fence sitters, as we might say, you know, people, well, I, I believe in God, but I don't know about this whole Jesus stuff, but, you know, um, kind of maybe some, some undecided there yet, uh, in that group. Um, if he says, if you continue in my word, and so what we're seeing, again, is perhaps this idea of them had starting to, to fade away from belief in Jesus, had starting to uh, lose some of their trust in him. And he's telling them, stick with it, continue. Um, you know, the, the whole one day at a time thing, follow me a little longer, stick with me, see what you see what happens. Um and so he wants them to, to have that lasting relationship. And that's, uh, that's the thing that we're looking for as far as our faith, is that lasting relationship. Um, he says to continue in my word. And so again, he's, we see that sense of faith there. He doesn't say, start believing in me. It's, you know, they're already believing in him to some extent. He wants them to continue now in that belief, to continue following him. Um, it gives a sense that the believer must move completely into the sphere of influence and action of Christ's word. 
and let himself be led to that deeper union with Christ, which the word meno, which actually means abide, um, which that word means. So he says, if you abide in my word, um, you know, we think about abiding in a house, our, our abode. Um, it surrounds you. It's where you find comfort. It's where you find security. <clears throat> so to abide in Jesus' word is to be surrounded, be immersed in that word, to find your security there, to be, make that your safe place, if you will. Um, and that word shows up again when he talks about the slave that does not have a permanent place in the household. Um, the slave does not abide in the household. Um, you know, the slave is there. The slave is works for the household. <coughs> Excuse me. But the slave is not an integral part of the household like the son uh, that he refers to, like a, a real family member. So what Jesus wants us to do is have that abiding in him, continue in him, sort of more that family type relationship. And, you know, we, we often say in baptism, we are children of reborn children of God, which makes us brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, which makes us, gives us that a familial relationship. So it's abiding and having that family type relationship with Jesus. Um, uh, let's see. I did my word, and the word there is logos. And uh, logos has, again, several meanings. Um, volumes could be written about the many meanings of this word, especially as used in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Besides the two instances in chapter 8, it also occurs in verse 43 with the verb to hear. Uh, and to keep a few variations in translating my logos or my word. It could refer to the actual words and statements that Jesus has spoken. So you take that literally, what I have said. Um, it could refer to the logic or reasons behind Jesus' statements. Okay, so it goes beyond the words to, okay, what is he telling us? What is the meaning of this? Um, or it could refer to the revelation of Jesus himself. And, you know, we go back to the beginning of John's gospel where he says, in the beginning was the word. Well, that is the word logos, just like the word used here. So it is that, that revelation of Jesus himself, the understanding of who Jesus is. Um, with all the discussion today about whether or not we can actually know the words of Jesus, I'm inclined to stress Jesus' logic and his actual statements. This is what I think Martin Luther did. He sought the logic of justification by faith. Oh, he has this backwards. Just, it should be justification by grace through faith behind all the words of Scripture. Even though I believe this is the logic behind our Christian faith, I don't think this is the logic behind all the words of scriptures. <laughs> so, um, mm -hmm. you know, and so in that case, if this is the, the interpretation, say, that Luther took, makes it fitting for uh, this Reformation Sunday that we study that. So, you know, Jesus' word, the, the, the revelation of Jesus himself, the uh, faith in who Jesus is, um, all that stuff is wrapped up in, in his word um, and abiding or surrounding himself in his word. Um, another commentator says, uh, what do they need to do in order to remain in Jesus' word? Like so many other terms in John, word or logos is ambiguous, multifaceted, and rich in nuances. Jesus himself is the Logos that God speaks, through whom God created the world. He is God's word made flesh. Yet Logos can also refer to Jesus' teachings or any ordinary word. So, you know, kind of kind of a, a broad, uh, you know, interpretation here. Um, and I think 
as we talk about, you know, faith and, and, and justification and all that, but like faith in Jesus, I think it is more than just what Jesus says. You know, to, to believe what Jesus says is one thing, but to have that complete trust and hope uh, and faith in Jesus as the source of our salvation, I think, is more what this logos, this revelation of Jesus is all about. Um, <clears throat> he says, you will know the truth. Um, to know, to be, you know, we've talked before about the difference between believing and knowing. And belief in Jesus leads to knowing the truth about Jesus. Um, it is relational. It is to have a trust in someone. Um, to know someone means more than just, you know, oh, yeah, I had lunch with them one day. Um, it means you have this relational uh, trust with someone um, and, and that relationship with someone. And um, the truth, the New, New Interpreter's Bible um, interprets the truth as the presence of God in Jesus. So, again, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God, one of the persons of the Holy Trinity. Jesus is God. And, you know, in a, in a sense, that is part of the truth that we know, that Jesus is God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, as we often describe it. Um, <clears throat> and the truth uh, will set you free. And the truth is connected then to the Son, because the truth will make you free. In verse 36, he says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So the truth is the Son. The truth comes from the Son. We know that Jesus uh, at one point says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He identifies himself as the truth. Um, so there's, again, a lot that is, uh, what I want to say, it's not necessarily a, a concrete truth. Um, like, you know, the difference between truth and a lie, um, you know. Um, and, you know, Pilate's question, what is truth, you know, um, and that's, that's a big question for many of us. But when it comes to our Christian faith, the truth is Jesus. And the salvation that we have through our faith in him, the word that he brings us from God, um, he's the one who makes us free. And that freedom comes at a great price on Jesus' part, he goes to the cross to pay that price that sets us free. And our faith tells us that that is the truth. And, you know, another one of the things that Luther often said was uh, one of the hardest things about faith is to believe it is for me. You know, we talk about Jesus dying for the sins of mankind. But it can be hard for us to accept that Jesus was willing to do that for us as an, each of us as an individual, you know, because like Luther, we get that sense of, well, I'm not deserving. Why would anybody do that for me? You know, why would God give up himself for me? And again, it comes back to love and grace. Um, so the truth is that part of the faith that says, you know, yeah, this isn't just in general. This is for me. Still fine. Oh, well, you're what? popular. No, that's her alarm. That's my alarm. Okay. Tell me to take my pill. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Yeah. So that that truth is again Jesus and the revelation of Jesus as the source of our salvation. Um. What else do I got here? I just sidetracked. Oh, it's a good, uh, again, my buddy Brian Stoffridge, and he says, um, in talking about Paul, he says, the apostles 
is saying that you and Paul and I have been sprung <laughs> right now, not next week or at the end of the world, and unconditionally with no probation officer to report to. But that means we have finally come face to face with the one question we have always thought we were aching to hear, but that we now realize we have scrupulously ducked every time it was got within a mile of us. It was the question I raised in the very first chapter and it has been lurking all along. What would you do with freedom if you had it? And, uh, or as he says, uh, you are free. What do you plan to do? And, you know, that's kind of an interesting way to think of it. You know, we, we have this freedom. That's the truth. Now, what are we going to do with this freedom? Um, and then where Luther, uh, Luther's saying sin boldly that we may have heard uh, often. Luther said sin boldly. Um, not necessarily as a license to sin, but we take that in context. He says, if you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true and not a fictitious grace. If grace is true, you must bear a true and not a fictitious sin. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly, but believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly. For he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. As long as we are here, we have to sin. This life is not, not the dwelling place of righteousness, but as Peter says, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Pray boldly. You too are a mighty sinner. So, you know, again, it's that, that reality, I think, with making it real, bringing it home. Um, you know, that, that if, if we are being truly forgiven, we have to have something to be forgiven for. So we can't pretend that we're not sinners. And we can't convince ourselves or anyone else that we are not sinners. Um, we all, you know, as we hear, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Luther's saying, well, how do you still think, you know? Um, and I like that line, you know, God doesn't forgive fictitious sinners. <laughs> he forgives real sinners. That's us. This is the real thing. Um, so, uh, you know, that reality here is the truth. Uh, a big part of the truth is that reality that Jesus uh, sets us free from that sin that we can't avoid. That is, you know, we might be wonderful people, good people, great people, but we are not perfect. And so, you know, Jesus has resolved that issue for us on the cross. Um, what else do I have here? I have a number three. Yeah, that the embodiment of truth is found in Jesus. So, but John here may be using truth as a title for Jesus. And again, you know, we said that Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the light. So um, it's, you know, our that truth is that part of that faith that everything that is is wrapped up and based on Jesus and in Jesus that's where the truth uh, of our faith comes from um, and the truth will make you free meaning you are uh, no longer dominated by and you know as Luther explains we're no longer dominated by the law um, you know, part of our reading from Paul says, if you, you know, you you uh, live under the law, you are a slave to the law. And, you know, that's true. When you think about, I must do everything perfectly right, is to be a slave to the law. And, you know, Jesus comes along and says, look, I know you can't do everything perfectly right. 
I'm going to take that responsibility for you. What you need to do is respond now in a way that shows your love, your appreciation for God and neighbor. So again, we have that. It's not, not license to sin, but the freedom of knowing that that sin is not a death sentence as far as, you know, our eternal uh, salvation and freedom. So these Jews who Jesus is talking to said, uh, we are descendants of Abraham. And of course, they're talking biologically. They are of the, the house and lineage of Abraham, as we hear about Jesus being the house and lineage of David. Uh, descendants of Abraham. They come from Abraham's DNA. They can trace their heritage all the way back to Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. And um, so given that Jesus' answer is in the terms of spiritual slavery of sin, we may assume that the Jews are also speaking of spiritual slavery. So they're probably claiming that Although they have over the years been political slaves, they have never under God lost the freedom of their inner life or their soul. Now, you know, another way to think of that is if they, they're thinking on a different level than Jesus. Jesus is talking about being slaves to sin, uh, being in the, the spiritual kind of slavery. And they're looking more at political slavery. Now, the interesting thing is uh, that the Jews were slaves uh, to the Egyptians, you know, back in the Old Testament times. Um, the Jews Jesus is speaking to now, while not necessarily slaves, are being ruled by the Roman government. So they are, in essence, slaves or uh, subservient to the Roman government. And so they seem to be in a sort of a denial here, you know, that, that, and, you know, this generation Jesus is talking to, of course, they might not have ever been slaves like the slaves in Egypt, but again, they are under control of the Roman government. Um, and again, Jesus isn't really talking to them about that political kind of slavery but this spiritual slavery. We are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. If you remember that uh, confession that we use quite often you know, in the past, um, we, are, we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We are slaves to sin. And that's what Jesus is talking about. And so he says, um, and they say, so what do you mean by saying we'll be made free? Um, Again, that sense of, you know, if we're not slaves, uh, how can we be made free? And uh, so they are, they're counting on their heritage. They're, count, you know, as if we would say, well, I've been a Lutheran all my life. And so, you know, how can you say that I've been a slave or that I must be made free? Because I've been a Lutheran all my life. I'm, I'm surely, you know, going to go to heaven. And, well, you know, Jesus is, a, you know, I'm sure there are at least a few Lutherans who aren't, uh, you know, that faithful and might, might be questionable when the time comes. Um, but um, they're counting on their, their physical, again, their background, their, their descendants. Um, and then uh, Jesus answers them. And I wanted to share with you what the the how the message translates uh, those next couple verses. Jesus says, "I tell you most solemnly that anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead end life and is in fact a slave. A slave is a transient who can't come and go at will. The son though has an established position." The run of the house. So if the sun sets you free, you are free through and through. So uh, the, the, the part that really struck me there was the idea that a slave is a transient who can't come and go at will. That again, you, you have that 
slavery to sin. You're controlled by sin. Uh, you can't break free of sin. Where through faith in Jesus, he gives us that freedom that It frees us from the consequences of sin. It frees us from the control of the law. And it gives us the freedom to live a life that that Christ that, that God calls us to without fear of doing the wrong thing. If we truly in our heart live as best we can according to God's will. Then we we have we're we're free of condemnation. See, this is tricky stuff, <laughs> um, and that's why you know I, I've read before that when people uh, first start to believe, when they first come to faith, have them read the Gospel of John. Well, that's the last gospel I'd have them read because John is, is between John and Paul. You know, it's like blah 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 blah. What's the commercial now? We have yada yada yada. That's yeah. what, uh, what some of this sounds like, but um, but it, you know, it, and again, it takes some thought, and I think that's a good thing that, that it takes some thought. Um, you got to take it seriously. Um, so again, a couple more literal translations from when Jesus says, "Very truly, I tell you." Um, you know, as the message says, I tell you most solemnly, this is a serious teaching. Pay attention. Um, everyone who commits sin, the one doing sin um, versus the one doing the truth. You know, that's, um, let's see what I have. 321. Let's see what's in 321. Those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So those are the ones doing the truth um, come to the light. Their deeds have been done in God. These are the ones doing sin who Jesus says are slaves to that sin. So it's, it's sin that is their driving force, not not God. And you know, I, I I want to say driving force, not motivation, because I don't think well, there are not a lot of people who are motivated to sin. But when we get caught up in sin, when we get it kind of it, it pushes us, it drives us. It's something inside again that we can't get away from. And so we want that driving force to be God. We want that driving force to be our faith in Jesus. We want that to be what propels our life and controls our life. And so that is the truth. Be doing the truth is to live a life driven by faith versus doing sin, which is a life driven by sin. Um, and a slave to sin is one who is dominated by sin, controlled by sin. Um, the slave, and again, you know, the slave does not have a permanent place in the household. And that is, again, meno abide. The slave doesn't abide in the household as a family member does. Um, but the son, of course, does. It has a place there forever. And, um, you know, maybe a way to think about this, for the son to make you free, the, the son has to bring you into the family. Now, it's easy to think about that in our traditional terms, say, of, of marriage. Um, you know, a son gets married, brings the daughter-in-law into the family, she becomes part of the family and it has all the, the rights, responsibilities, and privileges of a family member. Um, the son, in, in this sense, could also be um, if, if you would bring a best friend into your home, if you would have a friend who was, um, you know, maybe uh, someone who's homeless, someone who's whatever, and you would more or less adopt them into your family. 
and make them a part of your family. Give them that permanent place. That is the son. That is Jesus bringing us in to God's family, making us a permanent part of that household. And so while we are out here lost and controlled by the law, Jesus says, no, come with me. Be a part of the family. I will make you free. You have all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities of being a part of this family. And, uh, and then, again, the son will make you free indeed. He'll make you genuinely free. Um, you know, in our, uh, the, the confession and forgiveness, the absolution now that we give, uh, in Jesus you are what, all, already and always free or something like that. Um, and that's, you know, through Jesus, through our faith. And uh, we are already and always free. Uh, free indeed, genuinely free. Oh, I have my phone on do not disturb. <laughs> so, um, again, we see freedom from sin is a gift of God available through faith, uh, trust, um, obedience, uh, faith in, in Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, we... It's again not something we earn. It's we are we are invited into the family. The the son, uh, you know, sees us in trouble, and invites us into the family. Gives us that relationship that makes us free as members of the family. So we don't we're not slaves to the law any longer. That we're not controlled by the law. We're controlled by our faith. And our faith is the driving force in our life. And I can't wait to see how this becomes a sermon. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> um, but that's kind of what I got for today. It's a short reading. Um, mm -hmm. But again, as often in Paul's uh, uh, or in John's gospel, um, those readings have a lot of meaning. Um, John uses a lot of words with, as we say, double entendre, words that can mean this, that, or both. And quite often he means both. Um, so, uh, you know, John is, is one that, that requires some thought. Um, Take some, take some thinking, take some working through. Um, and as I'm looking at my notes here, part of that freedom that we're talking about is the freedom to do and to not be afraid to do for fear we might do the wrong thing. You know, um, when you, again, are a slave to the law and you especially look at the letter of the law, um, you can be afraid to do the wrong thing so you don't do anything. Um, you know, we all we always we often use the example of you know stealing bread if you're hungry. Um, the law says do not steal. Um, or is it okay to you know to steal that loaf of bread to feed your family? Where if you are a slave to the law, well, no, we cannot steal, so we will starve. Um, so the freedom there is the freedom to do, and then knowing that if it's wrong, we have that grace. Not see this is this is where Paul gets himself in trouble. <laughs> it's not to say, well, do whatever you want because you could be forgiven. It's to say, do as best you can the right thing. And then if you mess up, then you go and ask for forgiveness. That's better than what, and I, I may not have heard you right, but I thought you said before about sin boldly. It's right. like, yeah. it doesn't equate. Yeah, well, but that's what, he, you know, what he's saying. You can't help but sin. Right. And so don't be afraid to live your life, basically. But then, and, but we also have to see the flip side: sin boldly, but believe even more boldly in the grace of God. You know that's 
So, yeah, it, since we can't help but sin, and, and sin is a part of our life, if we we would do nothing, we would sit, and 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 maybe that in itself is a sin because you're not serving, you're not helping, and so we have to do something. And I think uh, you know people again take that out of context a lot and say, "Well, Luther says sin boldly. I can do you know." <laughs> the more I sin, the more I'll be forgiven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and that's another thing. You know, where where a place where Paul gets himself in trouble, um, where you know he goes on about yes, if you sin, you receive grace, but I, and then you know then he flips around and says, "So does that mean we should sin more so we receive more grace?" Well, no, that's not what it means. <laughs> you know. So it's, uh, well, we say common sense is not so common, but maybe. <laughs> um, and, and I just keep coming back to, you know what, it's it's what's in your heart. You know, what is your heart telling you? Does your heart tell you, yes, I love God. I want to serve God. I want, you know, I'm thankful for Jesus. I want to, to help my neighbors. I want to do the right thing. And, you know, what more can you do? Um, so it comes again, it comes back to what, what is your, what, what is the driving force in your life? Is your driving force to serve yourself, uh, perhaps at the expense of others? Is your driving force, you know, self-centered, selfish, uh, unforgiving and all you know and, and just uncaring you know is a or is your driving force to love god and love your neighbor and to live accordingly you know and as far as i can see that's what it comes down to so you know maybe someday i'll find out i was wrong but i sure hope not so so that's what I got. Anybody got anything to add? No? No? Not even you, Hank. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what it takes some pondering. Thank you to touch this one. Yeah. Yeah. It, this, this is one to ponder. So, Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, thank you all. Yeah. See you next week or Sunday or whenever. Yeah.